your video and your and your audio off, please. Got it. Thank you. Okay. We're going to open the meeting now to everyone. Okay. Good luck, everyone. Thank you. Welcome everyone. It is with pleasure that Sharon Clark and I welcome you to the sixth annual Patients Redefining the Future of Healthcare in Canada Summit. I would like to begin by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that each of us live on today. While we meet on a virtual platform from coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territories of all the First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples that call these lands home. We affirm our commitment and responsibility to improving our own understanding of our local Indigenous peoples, including First Nations, Inuit and Métis, and to improving relationships. Please join me in a moment of reflection to acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past that continue, and to consider how we can each in our own way move forward with meaningful efforts of reconciliation. I didn't expect to be saying this again this year, but I also want to take a moment to remember those who have lost their lives over this past year and this pandemic overall, directly or indirectly due to COVID-19. I send well wishes to those who are ill and wish them a speedy recovery. I heartily thank first responders and other healthcare workers who have and still are working long difficult hours on our behalf across this country and in other countries as well. Never have the issues of sustainability and effectiveness of healthcare systems and delivery been more in the forefront of people's minds than they are today. Never have patients felt more that they need and in their, are entitled to a meaningful voice in the future of upon which their welfare depends. Let's be clear, problems with the healthcare system have existed long before this pandemic. This pandemic has exasperated them and pre probably created some new ones. I would like to thank our sponsors in alphabetical order for today's event, Abvi, Amgen, AstraZeneca, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Novartis, Merck, Roche, and Leo Pharma for making it possible for all of us to come together virtually. Thank you to IMC for supporting the summit working groups and thank you to Axon for your technical support. Please help us spread the word by posting to social media media using the following hashtags. It is my pleasure to now introduce Sharon Clark. Sharon, over to you. Sharon, sorry, it's Louise. Please unmute. No, I got it, I got it. Sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much, Kathy, for your words, uh, especially the uh, land acknowledgement. I very much appreciate that and uh, in the spirit of reconciliation. So thank you very much for that. Um, so my name, uh, as Kathy indicated, is Sharon Clark. I'm a Cree from the Chagaste Basin Cree Nation in Saskatchewan. And I'm an advocate of health for all, and in particular, equitable health for Indigenous people. So a big welcome to everyone. It is great to be here on this first day of this very important summit. Um, as you have heard, we have some wonderful speakers and I encourage you to take every opportunity to engage, discuss and let your voice be heard. As patients, advocates and allies, we can help redefine the future of healthcare in Canada to better meet the needs of all. It is more important now than ever as the world deliberates on our future to be part of the conversation for our children and grandchildren and for the next seven generations. It is our responsibility to ensure that a healthy future is possible. We look forward to hearing from you to make this summit a meaningful step forward. And with that, I hand the floor over to Leah Stevenson. Thank you. 
Hi, everyone. I'm just bringing up my slides. And hopefully they work correctly. There we go. I hope everyone can see those. Welcome once again. Um, thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Kathy. I just wanted to provide a quick overview of what will be happening over the next few days uh, today and then a few housekeeping notes as well. So we're very excited about um, the speakers, panelists and breakout conversations that we get to enjoy with all of you over the coming four days. Um, and today we are focusing in on echo pandemics in healthcare. As you know, our overall theme is echo pandemics. Um, you know, obviously, you know, what has been happening as it relates to COVID-19 and the impacts uh, of, of the pandemic and pandemic responses. Um, so today we're focusing in on those echo pandemics in healthcare. On Wednesday, we hope you can join us for an incredible session uh, with on echo pandemics in Indigenous health. We have keynote speakers um, such as uh, Dr. Veronica McKinney and Marion Crow, as well as uh, panelists from Kai Hai who will be sharing with us. On Thursday, November 18th, we move to echo pandemics, the way forward. Uh, so here we will be hearing from impact uh, on the importance of equity um, and the determinants of health in uh, solving <laughs> our echo pandemic issues and moving forward in, in a way that is going to help us uh, improve the system as a whole and improve what we need as uh, people trying to use that system effectively. We're also going to be hearing about the importance of data um, and uh, various initiatives that are really important happening as it relates to data and uh, patient reported outcome measures and also some other updates related to value-based healthcare work that we've been doing through our working groups. And on our final day, Friday, November 19th, is when our uh, those of you who are patients, caregivers, patient representatives with patient groups or caregiver groups, and we do have a few citizen groups that like to join us now as well, um, you're all welcome to join us on Friday, November 19th, when we have more of, a, uh, we have no presentations. And what we're doing is we're planning together of what we should be doing together for the coming year as it relates to what we're learning from our sessions together. Today, as I mentioned, we're diving into echo pandemics in healthcare. And so we're very excited to have Dr. Adelstein Brown, who will be our keynote speaker with um, Q&A, and I will explain to you in just a second how you uh, ask questions. Um, then we will move to a panel with uh, a number of panelists who will be, uh, be providing perspectives of echo pandemics related to uh, chronic conditions, related to oncology, and related to mental health, in particular youth mental health. And then we have Dr. Craig Earle from the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer, who will be presenting uh, more on the echo pandemics in oncology and what CPAC as a national organization is doing to begin to try to address them. And then we'll move to breakout sessions. And those breakout sessions, you don't need to do anything on your end. You will be automatically assigned to a breakout room when we come to that time. There will be a facilitator in your room and there'll be some guided questions uh, to help you all synthesize what you've been learning together and see if there's themes coming out from what you've been learning and hearing. And then just some quick housekeeping notes. Um, during our plenary session, all lines uh, should be muted automatically. Your video should already be off. Please keep them that way. Um, during breakouts, obviously, uh, we invite you to unmute yourself and engage in the conversation. This session is available uh, in both French and English and is being recorded in both languages. If you want to access the French interpretation, please click on the world icon at the bottom of your screen, click on mute original audio and then select French. Um, if you have a question that you would like to pose to any of the speakers or panelists, please click on the chat button at the bottom of your screen and type your question right into the chat directed to everyone so everyone can see your question and then please press enter. Our moderator will keep an eye out for your questions and will field as many as, of them as time allows. And then finally, if you're having any technical difficulties, uh, don't hesitate to send a, a note through the chat box to Axon Technical Support. You'll see that there's two folks named Axon Technical Support in, uh, in the participant list. You can chat to them directly and they will help you with your technical difficulty. 
Finally, um, I want to encourage everyone to please complete the evaluation. The, the link will be coming out after the event today. We'll have an evaluation after each of our days. Um, they are brief and we'd really love your feedback. It helps us get better. And finally, there will be an event report that will come out after the event is over um, and will be shared with everyone. We're also, the recordings will be posted and shared as quickly as possible through the event website. And that's all as it relates to housekeeping and the agenda. I am now very pleased to pass the microphone over to my colleague, Louise Binder, who's the health policy consultant at Save Your Skin Foundation. Over to you, Louise. Thank you very much, Leah. I would like to start by echoing the sentiment expressed by Kathy and Sharon in their opening remarks. And I'd like to thank all of you for taking time out of what I know is a very exhausting and stressful period for all of us uh, to join and to talk about these issues today. I know that some of the material in this summit is disturbing, frustrating, and tragic. It's hard to feel optimism. I like to think of myself as a realistic optimist, if there's such a thing. I know things are discouraging, but I know there are solutions. And I know for certain that patients, patient representatives, and caregivers are at the center of the solution to those problems. Working with stakeholders like our keynote speaker this morning, we can get through the pandemic and deal with the echo pandemics that it has caused. In fact, I think we can come out stronger and in fact become less fragile to disturbances in the healthcare system. Without further ado, I'm honored to introduce Adelstein Brown, also known as Stanie Brown, who is probably well known to many of you. He's a professor and dean, Dalalana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto, and has held many senior leadership positions in policy and strategy with the Ontario government, has had founding roles in startup companies, and extensive work and has done extensive work on performance measurement. He received his undergraduate degree in government from Harvard University and his doctorate from the University of Oxford, where he was a Rhodes Scholar. Most importantly, for today's discussion, he is the co-chair of Ontario's COVID-19 Science Advisory Table. So with no further ado, I hope that Dr. Brown has been able to join us. Um, and uh, oh, he may he may in fact not have been able to join us yet. He uh, he was in another meeting and was actually uh, uh, going to come in, uh, in in a few moments. So, um, Leah, uh, in the interim, uh, should we uh, see if people have any uh, introductory comments or questions that they might like to ask? That would be a good place to start. So Staney will be joining us shortly. Yes, he's just coming from one meeting uh, to our meeting in order to present. So um, I think now would be a good opportunity uh, if I think many people know who Staney is. Certainly those of us in Ontario do, <laughs> as he's been very prominent in leading our pandemic response. If people feel that they might have some questions that they're anticipating for Dr. Brown, we would welcome them. Um, at this point, I think we would welcome them in the chat um, so that we can make sure that we ask those questions of him when hopefully we have time when he finishes up. And I'm not, I'm not sure if there are any. Uh, also, I'm just, if, so, so, certain, certainly if anyone has any general questions uh, about the agenda or for any of us, um, please uh, feel free to ask them now while we wait for Stanley to join us. 
I will pose great. one question just to make sure people are thinking about it a little bit. Um, one of the big questions from Ontario that I have is about how patients will be involved in the work going forward. So as moderator, Louise, just putting that out there as something to keep in consideration with um, how and, and what um, Stanley Brown does have to say about that particular aspect of, of moving forward. That's so great. Uh, we also... So just just um, uh, just to say uh, that uh, in preparation, of course, for his presentation, he and I had a, a good chat, just um, uh, uh, the two of us. Um, and I asked him actually about where have patients been uh, in the pandemic work? I just haven't seen them. Maybe they're there somewhere, but I haven't seen them. And he was candid that our systems, I am sure he will be candid again today, that our systems really uh, did not take that into account. And that the types of the, the tables that have been set up, certainly in Ontario, uh, to work on the pandemic, um, probably could have uh, thought about that a little better. So Antonella, thank you. I, I hope that uh, I, I hope that we'll have the opportunity to ask him to talk a little bit about that um, publicly, but uh, he did certainly concede to me uh, that he was aware that that was certainly a gap, uh, and, uh, and, and maybe we can give him some suggestions uh, throughout <laughs> the summit uh, as to how he can much better meaningfully engage uh, patients uh, as we go forward. So that, I love uh, that idea and I encourage people. Uh, so not only could you share some questions, uh, but if you have ideas around maybe potential uh, recommendations to include those in, uh, in your comments as well. Um, we also have a question, Louise, uh, coming about um, for Dr. Brown about involvement uh, uh, related to Indigenous health impacts, his involvement related to Indigenous health impacts of, uh, of the pandemic. So, and, and then going forward. So that's yeah. a particular community. Yeah, that could be of interest to hear from him on. It would be very interesting. I, I uh, attended uh, a Dalai Lama um, webinar um, on indigenous uh, initiatives, actually. He wasn't directly engaged, but a number of his colleagues were. And uh, it would be wonderful for him to talk a little bit about their work. Um, and uh, it certainly sounded uh, quite exciting how it has uh, how it has integrated with the pandemic would be certain and how and how it will be integrating moving forward um, would certainly be very interesting um, to hear. So yeah, let's uh, let's put him on the spot on that one too for sure. The longer he takes to join us, the, the more difficult the questions are going to get. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it gives more people time to, to sort of think it through and, uh, and have some, you know, we should ask him some tough questions. I think that there are some, you know, honest and tough questions that need to be put to not just the Ontario government, but, uh, <laughs> but including the Ontario government uh, about uh, many aspects of this pandemic and, and other um, health and disease groups. And um, certainly uh, I, I think that, you know, this is our chance. Um, so let's take it. And I, I know he's very well respected by his colleagues in other provinces. So um, if we can get some great ideas uh, from um, uh, for him, perhaps we can uh, have him spread them uh, across the country as well. Uh, I think some of his colleagues, if we're if, if you're brave enough to watch the news these days, I think you can see that some of his colleagues uh, could certainly use some help in the other provinces. Uh, so um, um, perhaps we can send some messages across the country through him as well. And if, if anyone feels like there's been some sparkling, incredible examples of, uh, you know, pandemic responses and patient co-design and partnership in those responses in your geography, in your jurisdiction, we would please uh, include that in a comment or as part of a question. I think one thing that we would love to be able to do here is, uh, at, in general through the summit, is to be able to share where there might be pockets of excellence or some really 
uh, great exemplars that people are enthusiastic about and surface them um, and, 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 and use this opportunity to share them with uh, speakers and with participants. So, you know, we're, we're from across the country. So hearing about what's happening elsewhere, that's really exciting that we might not be aware of and that we might want to try to either replicate if we're in that position or encourage its replication or adaptation, uh, you know, depending what your role is, um, I would really encourage uh, people to please share anything that you think is very exciting that is happening in your area that uh, is relevant for the speaker and um, perhaps something that they should be doing themselves or that the rest of us would like to know about. Uh, I'm just noticing a comment that came in here. I hope they can set up a structure that has experts and patient advisors rather than just politicians making the decisions. Right. So. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, hard to argue with that. <laughs> at least, at least in this crowd, I don't. I think it's hard to argue with that. Ah, uh, we're delighted to see that you've been able to join us, Danny. We've been, we've been uh, in your absence. We've been thinking up some uh, interesting questions for you <laughs> after your presentation. So uh, I hope you're all. I hope you've had enough coffee. <laughs> Go right ahead. Over to you. Great. Thank you. And let me just uh, share my screen to uh, get the uh, uh, PowerPoint up and going. Here we are. Okay. Hopefully, uh, hopefully everyone can see that and everyone can hear me uh, hear me well enough. Look, I want to just talk for probably about uh, 15, 20 minutes with you today and leave some time for questions, but really talk about um, the way that the COVID pandemic and its echoes and the, the waves that will follow on in this pandemic uh, are going to perhaps refocus us or reinforce the importance of some of the ways that we think about our health system, and role of patients, the way we conceive of value, and, and hopefully set us on a firmer course forward uh, with a, a better uh, system. So, look, I, I know sometimes it's uh, hard to have a talk or right around lunch, or you've just had a bit of a, a bite to eat or uh, you're about to get a bite to eat. But let me just summarize the whole talk here. And if you don't see anything else after this slide or nothing interests after you after uh, this slide, maybe this will stick with you, though. So the pandemic has been a huge shock to our health system. It's been a huge shock to our society. But the pandemic and its after effects are gonna affect our health system for a number of years. This is not something that when we finally take off our masks for good is done, it's gonna continue affecting, shaping, and in many ways, really challenging our system uh, over at least the next five, if not the next uh, 15 years. And these impacts are gonna require a different approach to our health system. Uh, but I'll sort of channel, channel John Evans, who years ago, when he was asked to write a report on, on what should happen in the Ontario health system, really kind of started the whole thing off saying, we didn't need to write this report because none of the solutions are new. Uh, what we really have, unfortunately, is a gap in implementation. We know what we need to do, uh, but we're not getting it done. Uh, so if we're going to actually change the way that we're framing, uh, if we're going to change what's going on, we need to change the way that we're framing. Uh, the problems. It's not just a money problem. Uh, you know, I work in the health system. I work uh, very closely in the public health system. Uh, we never ever say that we wouldn't uh, benefit from more money, but it's not just a money problem. We really need to rethink how we're looking at our, uh, our health system so that we set a stronger and a sustainable uh, future uh, with a, a very different, I hope, uh, value proposition. So this is not going to be done. Uh, the pandemic is going to have an impact for a long time, even after we're, uh, we're in kind of the norm, normal period or we're into endemicity and uh, other sorts of terms like that. Uh, but if we're going to respond to these impacts, we're going to have to take advantage of what we've already learned. And we're going to have to stop looking at this as just a money problem, which is far too, um, far too easy and far too comfortable, I think, sometimes to just frame it as a money problem. So let me talk about what is gonna happen after the pandemic. Let me talk about the waves of impact uh, that are gonna hit our health system over the next several years. And I'm grateful to uh, my colleague Vivek Well for this analogy of the waves, but it's, it's really like standing on a beach and watching big waves come and hit and just pull each time uh, a little bit of that beach away with it. So the first wave, I think we all know about, right? We have a huge surgical backlog. We have a huge backlog in care. Uh, we know there's been uh, any range number of people who've been unable to get to the care that they need during the pandemic. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, 
part of it is just the need to clear out the hospitals as we got ready for the uh, expected surge of ICU patients. Uh, part of it is uh, folks trying to limit what they're doing, trying to make sure that they're keeping uh, care safe. Uh, and part of it is actually that people are staying away from care. If you look at some of the more thoughtful people writing and thinking about the pandemic now, they talk about a disappearing patient. And so, you know, when we talk about a backlog, which I think last time we, uh, we publicly report on it was about a quarter of a million surgical cases that uh, had not happened compared to the previous year. But there's also this challenge now where people are showing up on wait lists or presenting for care uh, later and more ill than they might have otherwise. Uh, we see this in a number of different areas, even in emergency care, where we think it would be showing up quite quickly. Uh, we know, for instance, that alcohol consumption has increased hugely uh, in Ontario over the pandemic, uh, but we know that we're not seeing a surge in some of the alcohol-related cases or causes of, uh, of care. And so, you know, there's a big backlog compared to what we did see, and we now know that people are also not showing up for care, that we have these disappearing patients. So wave one is the wave that's, that's right in front of us. This is the uh, inability to kind of get to care, which is going to need to be made up for a number of people uh, over the next uh, several years. The next wave is really this post-acute wave. And, you know, I've shown here the, the report from our science table here in Ontario on this topic is what we tend to call uh, long COVID. And, you know, I think sometimes when we look at these new emerging sort of syndromes or problems like this, uh, we are a little bit cautious. Uh, sometimes we're a little bit skeptical about what this means. But at least looking at the uh, work, say, out of the United Kingdom, there's 10% of cases that are experiencing substantial difficulties uh, half a year out. And so, and this isn't 10% of hospitalizations. This isn't 10% of the people who are most affected by COVID. This is 10% of all of the cases uh, that we're looking at. And so the second wave is really this wave of kind of all of the complications and issues that follow on ha having been infected with this disease. And there's lots of, there's lots of reasons to you know, expect that this is gonna persist, that there's gonna be some new presentations here. Uh, for any of you who saw that uh, Awakenings movie, you know that uh, part of that whole uh, syndrome that uh, was acted out in that movie is really uh, some type of interaction between flu and other issues uh, that led to these people in a, in a really kind of a comatose state for a long period of time. We probably haven't uh, here uh, now uh, really described the full nature of post-acute uh, COVID or long COVID yet. Um, but we know there is uh, something here that's going to be really the second wave. And it's, it's already starting to build and, uh, and hit on our system. So wave one is this backlog of care we know. Wave two is this uh, sort of new thing, this post-acute COVID or long COVID syndrome. And, it, you know, the first two waves, it's perhaps easier to quantify, <clears throat> excuse me, what we're actually dealing with here. It's easy to know about how many surgeries we did in 2019 and how many we didn't do in 2020 or 2021. Uh, it's relatively easy when we've got an idea of at least, or at least some idea of how many cases we've had to think about how much uh, long COVID we'll have to deal with. But you start to think about wave three now, this is all of the distress, uh, the mental health distress and other issues that we've known uh, has started to build throughout the pandemic. Well, there's lots of reasons <clears throat> why this has been building. But I have to say, I don't think we have a full understanding yet of what that impact is going to look like. <clears throat> Excuse me. We know that uh, there is a high level of uh, stress and distress across any number of different groups in our society. Uh, we see some of this materialize right now in very, very acute and very sort of tragic ways around eating disorders uh, or opioid uh, overdoses. Uh, but there is a range of things that will... Uh, uh, will be uh, driving a lot of healthcare use and not just mental health care use. You know, study after study after study that we look at, uh, when we look at things like chronic disease control, we know that mental health and physical health are tightly related. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see, uh, you know, obviously a wave of need for mental health and addictions care, but we may also see a significant increase in chronic disease and other types of care that are required because of some of the mental health challenges that we've seen during the COVID pandemic. Fourth wave is really the impact of all the social disruption and unemployment uh, that has happened during- Alors, la quatrième vague. Et bien évidemment, tôt, uh, ma collègue, uh, un modèle très intéressant là-dessus. Voici 
euh, l'effet qui a été fait au niveau de la, des perturbations au niveau social. Les gens ont perdu leur travail. Les agents ont vu leur compagnie sombrer. Et ça pousse les maladies chroniques. Cette vague se, se construit, euh, grandit, ça va prendre un bout de temps, mais on va voir. Il y a ces maladies chroniques, ces quatrième vague, diabète, cancer, qui commencent à monter à cause du chômage et des. Euh, la vague 3, c'était la santé mentale. La vague 4, c'est surtout le trouble sociaux. <coughs> Excusez-moi. Alors, parfois, on regarde ça. Just the need uh, for some uh, treatment. But I think it's important to kind of understand that what has happened with the pandemic has happened all the way along the continuum of care. Uh, I spent a uh, little while ago, a little time uh, a few months ago getting ready to give a talk to the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer. And if you just take the relatively simple or relatively clear pathway uh, through our cancer system, of screening, diagnosis, <clears throat> treatment, uh, and, uh, and palliation, all of those uh, aspects of our system have, uh, have gotten backed up. And so we're not just saying, okay, we, we just have to really spin the wheel faster and do a lot more care. We're actually saying that we need to think about that whole continuum of care uh, as we go along. What is it that we actually need to do to, uh, to move things forward? And so uh, a critical, critical, critical issue here, it's not just these waves of impact, uh, it's actually a whole and you know, individual sort of bits of care that we can somehow make up. It's actually a continuum of care that we're gonna have to look at uh, as we go along on this. And I think it's really important to keep in mind as well that this has not been a, uh, an equitably distributed or a fairly distributed pandemic. There's a lot of reasons for this, but primarily, fundamentally, the biggest reason is that the risks of exposure are clustered in those communities where people are engaged in essential work, where they don't have the ability to work from home, uh, where we've got multi-generational housing, where we don't have so, uh, appropriate housing with essentially a room per person. Uh, and in these sorts of settings, you know, where people have to take public transport, they don't have the luxury of a, a nice car to sort of, or a car to go to work in. Uh, all these things increase the risk of exposure. And not surprisingly, we see the impact of the pandemic the worst uh, in our uh, marginalized communities. Those low income, racialized communities, uh, First Nations, Inuit, Matiti uh, communities, all these have been impacted uh, really, really, really the most strongly. And this creates uh, another a challenge in how we kind of work our way out. So all these ways of impact on our health system, <clears throat> a real sort of backup along the entire continuum of care. This isn't just a matter of surgery. And finally, clustering of these problems in our uh, most vulnerable communities. And this, this leads to not only kind of, a, again, a problem that or a, a, an echo of the pandemic that we need to work our way out of, it actually leads to questions around the sustainability from a political perspective of our system. Because you know, we, we pride ourselves in this country on the fact that care is available to all. Uh, but this is a place where the system, that sort of promise of at least uh, free care at the point of consumption, is not going to be able to make up for it. And there's a real challenge to our system there. Uh, but you know, not to sort of lose sight, you know, we may be out of uh, the pandemic. We may be into endemicity very shortly uh, in this country, maybe sometime in the spring. I guess that's the hope. But it is going to be a significant pandemic for a number of years globally. And so we need to make sure that we keep in mind that not only is it inequitable here, uh, it's inequitable uh, across the globe. Okay, uh, I promised I, uh, I wouldn't take much more than about 15 or 20 minutes to uh, chat at you to leave some time for questions. I'm about halfway through here. So we have, I think I've made a case that we've got these echoes, these waves uh, that are really very, very challenging for our system. Um, what can we do about it? Well, as we kind of move into thinking about what to do about it, I think we need to keep in mind that this has had a huge economic impact and it's had a highly inequitable economic impact. So our ability to kind of spend our way out of this problem as we have with uh, some of our previous healthcare crises is gonna be severely limited. And people's ability to kind of somehow buttress what they're doing out of their own resources is gonna be limited as well, at least in a number of different groups who you know, both 
as uh, professions or as occupational categories and as the individuals in that are going to be working their way out of the sort of the whole of the pandemic for a long, long time. Okay. <clears throat> so what's the way forward? There is no new approach that we need to consider. There is no silver bullet that if we just did this or we just did that, everything's going to be fixed. Uh, what the COVID pandemic has done is it has really laid bare not only the inequities in our system, as we always point out, but also the challenges, the structural and other challenges that have existed in our system for a long time. We were unprepared for the pandemic. We should not have been caught off guard by the inequity of the pandemic. Uh, where we have had success, it's really been because of the hard work of the people in our system, which is where a lot of our success always comes from. Our ability to count on highly trained and highly committed men and women uh, who are willing to really go the extra two, three, ten miles uh, to get stuff done. What we need to do uh, to work our way out of this, to really kind of get a sustainable system, is what we've known we need to do for a long time. The first is to actually invest across the continuum. Uh, there is, particularly when we get close to elections, this focus on making sure that we cut wait times, focusing on the most acute uh, side of our, uh, our system, that kind of treatment bit at the top here of this uh, wheel that the Institute of Medicine put together years ago, I guess half wheel that the Institute of Medicine put together years ago to talk about the uh, continuum of care. But we need to make sure that we are investing in prevention. We need to make sure that we are investing in treatment and we need to make sure that we're investing in maintenance. I've just stepped out of a, a session on the future of public health in Canada and what we need to be looking at. And the same issues come up again and again. We don't pay attention to prevention. We don't pay attention to uh, health literacy. We don't pay attention to empowering patients. We end up creating much more need for treatment than we uh, need to. And we often lose the maintenance um, uh, of folks once they are in a better condition or in a better place to make sure that they stay healthy. So not anything new here, but we do need to look at this as a portfolio and a portfolio in which we invest in a balanced way. So what else do we need to do? Well, we've talked for years about the importance of integrating care. And you know, I, I looked at a whole bunch of different graphics that I might have put here. I thought it'd be good to make a point and put one from almost 12 years ago by, uh, you know, among other people, uh, Nick Goodwin and uh, Jennifer Dixon. Uh, really, really important here to think that we've known about the importance of integration for a long time. Integrating organizations, we've not done a bad job on that, trying to get those efficiencies of scale. Integrating services or functions or clinical lines, we've done a much more poor job of that. I'll come back in a minute to talking about the importance of integrating that around the patient. But it's interesting, if you look at some of the uh, nice success stories that have emerged from the pandemic, it's where we see community groups, uh, healthcare providers, even hospitals working together and getting out testing or getting out support or getting out vaccination in ways that actually communities can benefit from and pick up. And so investing across the whole continuum of care, but also working to integrate that care, continuum of care is important as well. And it's, I think, really important as well to start to think about how we build a sustainable system. And I'll, I'll take a... Um, a little bit of uh, a moment here to just say, you know, when we look at a lot of our chronic diseases, uh, as we look at some of the investments that we might want to make, and you know, a good point made already in the chat about biomarkers, well, the payoff of those earlier investments, the payoff of those investments that go into contributing to diagnosis, uh, going to guiding treatment or, or providing better treatment, they pay off in a number of different places, but they don't pay off necessarily, at least in terms of uh, the eventual health status uh, and the eventual sort of cost of care right in the same office where they're administered or right in the community where they're provided. They pay off down the road. And if we don't have an integrated system, we don't create a place where people can see those payoffs and we'll continue to underinvest uh, in the types of care that we need and the types of care that work. So we need to look at uh, investment across the uh, continuum. We need to look at integrating that continuum. And I think we need to make sure that when we put up slides like this, and this is from an excellent uh, proposal for creating an Ontario health team put together by uh, Atrium Health Partners and its partners in Mississauga, that when we talk about integrating it around a patient, that we're actually doing that. 
Uh, we uh, always do, I think, you know, everyone here probably, or most people in this uh, audience today will agree with me that we spend a lot of time uh, really um, uh, expecting people to navigate their way through a system. It really needs to be integrated around the individuals who need care and, and their caregivers, and in a way that brings their voice to the table as well. And I know I'm starting to get close to my promise of uh, just 20 minutes, so I'll move it along. Uh, this is a really old paper, but I think there's a lot of value in kind of looking for how, at how long we've known about the importance of engaging patients in decisions, of really having strong patient voice in what's going on. Uh, you know, you want to reduce rates, you want to reduce costs, you want to improve quality. There's uh, a lot more recent work that really talks about the improvements of some of the types of quality. Uh, you want to make sure that you've got patients heavily engaged. And so it's not just integrating uh, around the patient, it's integrating with the patient. Uh, as we look at our system. Uh, and we also need to think finally, uh, not finally, but we also need to think very strongly about how we look uh, at how we spend money. Uh, this is work uh, led by uh, Bijan Teya, uh, MTS Daniel, uh, George Pink, David Klein, and actually myself on this as well, looking at how we spend our capital investments. Uh, and the short story is that we actually are very poor investors. Although we're spending a lot of money on healthcare capital, or we spend a lot of money on things like IT and on buildings, and those are critical investments, we're not basing those investments on how the system is going to be better. Uh, we're really not bringing that forward into how we kind of hold people accountable around those investments. And so as we start to think that, you know, as we start to, I think, cope with the fact that we will need to spend more and we'll need to spend more across a variety of different areas, we should be doing that always with this focus about how we're increasing value. Uh, I'll say uh, here as well that uh, it's important that when we do this, that we engage experts and the public in all of this. Uh, I think for too long, you can see, uh, you know, the, uh, what happened uh, tragically, unfortunately, in Alberta when we really didn't engage uh, experts. Uh, you'll see, I think, probably a more calm approach or a more cautious approach in Ontario that uh, paid off during the summer and the early parts of the fall, where there was strong public uh and uh, expert engagement if you get all these groups working together and patients you actually create open policy and more inclusive processes around what's going on with a strong focus on uh, making sure that everyone is uh, is up to speed on what we're doing we'll have a much better way forward now, i could spend the whole conference talking with you about the challenges of communicating science and engagement around science but i think there are ways to do it better uh, and we've seen some success in that at times in ontario and across canada and I'll, I'll just close here by saying, okay, uh, we know there's going to be huge impact. We know there's problems uh, that are going to keep on challenging our system uh, for uh, a long time. There's no new answers. We just need to really focus on what people have been talking about for a while. Uh, but we've had a huge implementation gap. How do we actually get past that? Uh, and this is uh, from Stephen Peckham, my colleague Stephen Peckham in the UK and some of his colleagues. Uh, he makes the point that, you know, we get into these implementation gaps, let's do something uh, that doesn't actually materialize. Sometimes we're optimistic and I think willfully so. Uh, we're always struggling with working through a dispersed governance system where you've got individual providers, you've got hospitals over here, you've got agencies, you've got regions, you've got any number of different sort of ways we structure our system that splits things apart. Now, I don't think that's gonna change. So we have to cope with that dispersed governance. governance. Uh, we do have uh, poor collaboration across a number of our areas, although when we do start to collaborate, we do a lot better. And political cycles often get in the way. It's uh, hard to get everything done that you might want to get done in a one political cycle. Uh, and we should always keep in mind that you know, politicians are running for office because they think they're going to make uh, things better. So they want to hold office. They need to kind of engage in that political process. Uh, but there are ways to kind of get around these sort of big barriers to implementation. Make sure we plan for implementation, and I'd argue transparently plan for implementation. When we talk about policies, we really need to make sure that we're talking about uh, how we're not only what we want them to do, not only why they're a good idea, not only what we're going to spend, but how we're going to actually implement them. We need to track that implementation, and this involves things like performance monitoring, it involves field visits, it involves audits, and it involves reporting out on what's happening. Uh, although we often talk about all the problems about putting data out into the world, when you put data out in the world, when you show what's going on, you actually create some accountability around it. 
Uh, and finally, we need to make sure we're supporting implementation. Policy and regulation are not just tools for making announcements or kind of launching stuff. They're actually tools for shaping and supporting things as they go along. We do need a problem solving approach rather than an approach that's focused on communicating around the problem. We need to actually communicate to solve the problem. Uh, and although this may seem like a very self-serving way to end at the end of the day, we do need a lot more education and support, uh, whether it be through degree programs or through public engagement and training to make sure that we can support policy implementation, uh, that we can support better engagement with our system, uh, and we can get ourselves uh, going in the way that we really want at the end of the day. And uh, with that, I think I'm just a, a little bit over the 20 minutes that I promised I'd take, and I'll uh, stop here and, uh, and go to questions if that's, uh, if that's helpful. Thank you very much. Ah, there. Thank you very much. Um, we'll start with a few questions that we worked uh, on together before your arrival. Um, and uh, so they're not in the chat, but I did keep track of them. Um, the one that should not surprise you at all is um, we'd love to hear some practical ways in which you are going to engage patients, their representatives, caregivers, and also across the continuum of patient groups that have different populations that have different health inequity challenges. Um, I watched one of your webinars, uh, not you personally, but Dalalana School, um, and you had uh, some amazing speakers from a diverse population. And so I'm wondering, could you speak a bit about that? Yeah, so I'll, I'll talk a bit about it, um, maybe from two uh, perspectives, you know, one of which is just kind of what we're doing, for instance, at the school. And so nowadays, uh, when we launch a new initiative, we make sure we've got some type of caregiver or patient representation on the actual sort of advisory bodies. You know, universities are very clumsy in how they do governance. They've got a very kind of hierarchical structure. But, uh, you know, we try to put uh, people now, solicit and work with people to try to get some engagement that's much more broad. Um, and so with one of the ones we just launched, there's a, a caregiver representative. Uh, as I look at some of the other things that we're doing, even around some of our more kind of quantitative data focused stuff, there's stronger uh, patient engagement representation. And that really helps if you're preparing and working through meetings in a way that everyone gets a chance to kind of participate and contribute. And there's, uh, there's good work there. So, you know, that's kind of what we're, we're doing on that front. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's probably table stakes now, hopefully, as we go forward in this world, where we expect everyone to do that. What can we do more broadly on this? Uh, I think you know, there's, there's gonna be more thoughtful voices in this conference uh, on that topic, but what I would say deserves some emphasis is a focus on openness uh, and transparency. I found that every time we put out more data and we think carefully about the type of data that we're putting out, uh, we get better engagement. Um, every time we take uh, the time to write uh, even simple things like lay summaries, uh, we do better. Um, I, you know, <laughs> I'll be sort of maybe telling a, a, a kind of a funny perspective on it, but, um, you know, I kind of track, in part it's probably my personality, but I track the types of hate mail and other things that I've gotten during the pandemic. Um, it's interesting the one thing that we almost never get is complaints about uh, putting out data. The more data that's out there, it gives people a platform to engage, whether they agree or disagree. Uh, and I think that's, that's something that we're losing within our health systems. We're less transparent, I think, today uh, than we were, say, 15 years ago. Uh, we've got concerns about privacy. We've got concerns about you know, unintended consequences. And, and the more that we can do around transparency, the better we'll do. Thank you. Two questions, uh, uh, follow up. One is, uh, um, they're both uh, actually um, from Sharon Clark, um, one of our uh, Indigenous partners in this summit. And of course, um, we'd like to, to hear from you on uh, engagement of uh, Indigenous populations and Indigenous principles uh, moving yeah. forward. And also, she's asking, um, how do we initiate this integrated system? Uh, what are the steps, the practical steps that we can take? Um, and, and can we move slowly, uh, uh, step by step, um, yeah. through a system transformation funded by the medical system? 
Mm. Okay, so neither of those are short answers or, or easy <laughs> answers. Uh, let me see if I can work through both. And, and thanks for the questions, uh, Sharon. So, you know, this is a thing that we are working through uh, at the school right now. Uh, we have a Master's of Public Health and Indigenous Health. Uh, we have an Institute of Indigenous Health. Uh, and we're slowly recruiting more Indigenous uh, faculty members to really, I think, fundamentally sort of, in many ways, change the pedagogy, right? Uh, and this has ranged from very physical things like indigenizing some of the space uh, so that it's actually welcoming and inclusive, uh, through to really, I think, dealing with questions that we would not even have thought about uh, five years ago. How do we teach or how do we share traditional knowledge? Um, one of the things we're coping with right now, and I think Angela Mashford Pringle is one of my faculty is going to pull it off, but how do we do a master's of public health uh, that is entirely on the land? Uh, and how do we work through on that? So you know, it, it really it kind of to deal with some of the issues that you've raised, we really have to kind of rethink a lot of the ways that we do things uh, and do it in a way that uh, I think includes um, and is always with communities, not sort of with an assumption about what's going on. And I'll, I'll give you, a, uh, I won't say too much about it, but I had a very challenging decision recently to deal with around an indigenous health question. Um, and you know, my default mode uh, is always to kind of make the decision and, and you know, try to lead from there and everything else. Uh, all of my uh, Indigenous faculty sort of slowed me down and we spent a lot of time talking to elders and that led to a much better decision. And it, it's, you know, both as an organization, but as individuals, it's, it's about approaching some of the decisions differently. Okay, that's a far too short an answer to that question. Let me deal with the second sort of uh, big question though, which is how do, we, uh, how do we get started practically on an integrated system? Okay. So I think the, the really good practical way to do it is to let individual communities sort it out themselves. And I, that is not a, um, if that sounds at all like kind of a throwaway answer, it isn't. When I've watched what say has happened in East Toronto, uh, where you've seen the hospital and the largest community services provider come together and actually start to shift money between the two groups uh, and actually from the hospital to the community services organization, not the way around. Uh, when I watch what they've done there uh, in terms of taking money that was designed to really provide more care and finding a way to get out into the community and shift the balance, that's exactly what you want. Uh, but had we started top down and said, okay, every integrated system has to have three of these and three of those, and it has to have this and it has to follow these rules, we never would have gotten there uh, because our tendency to try to manage risk and uh, avoid problems would have prevented the, you know, these, this very authentic partnership from taking place and, and taking risks. Um, the other thing I'd, I'd sort of say is, you know, you can kind of look north to Muskoka uh, and watch what they've done where they've actually engaged the municipality in a very different sort of uh, a set of, uh, of partners there again. That's another really exciting, exciting model that I think shows that when you let the communities figure out what they want to do, uh, <laughs> Yeah, well, <laughs> no, I'm, thanks, Sharon. I'm sort of aware of what the system tends to do. Um, the, uh, you, you get a different sort of uh, combination. The cautionary example here is what happened in Manchester, right? So uh, there's just been some interesting reviews in the uh, British press about uh, the Manchester experiment, which was trying to bring together all of the health and social services in Manchester. And at the end of the day, they concluded it was far too much bureaucracy. It was far too much top down. It was far too much kind of rules about what you can and, or how you should do stuff before figuring out what you want to do. And at the end of the day, it's probably not going to turn out to be successful. And I think the, I'm hopeful the ones that are a little more organic uh, are going to do a lot better here in Ontario. Uh, there's a question also in the chat about a challenge uh, to progress that that's related to the lack of common approach and understanding about measuring progress and yeah. uh, the, the potential for the use of the quadruple aim outcome. Uh, yeah. Could you comment on that? Yeah, sure. I, I know we're running uh, short of time. So the, the short answer to this would be yes. Okay. Uh, we just need to pick a lane on this stuff and get going. And I, I'll be maybe a little bit point or provocative here. 
about 15 years ago, we had uh, a standard set of hospital measures. We were moving towards a standardized set uh, of cancer measures. Uh, we had a uh, progress report came out for government with some standardized measures on that. And with the exception of some of the stuff on cancer, it's largely all disappeared now. Uh, and I think actually getting a good inclusive framework like the quadruple aim, you know, looking at uh, value to patients, looking at uh, the overall cost of care, looking at uh, the experience of care, looking at providers' experience is great, works really well. Uh, and then it's just a matter of starting to do uh, some engagement with people across the system, engagement with patients and get indicators into those uh, frameworks so that we start to get back to measuring things in a common way, which is, you know, there's always other things that people can measure to tailor to what the community needs are. Um, but we, uh, we do need something as well that uh, gives that sort of standard platform. So I agree entirely with you on that. So a last short question. Uh, how are we uh, going to get the federal government and the provinces uh, to work together here because it doesn't seem to me and I think most of our colleagues that we can really row our, uh, even though uh, at least one of your colleagues in Manitoba seems to want to be a nation within a nation. Um, I, uh, I think that's a, a tough order if we're really going to solve these problems. How are we going to uh, get yeah. folks, what, what, you know, what's the, what, what, what's the thing that would get them interested in working together? Okay, so uh, none of these have been small questions today, Louisa. <laughs> it's, uh, these are all really, really, really big, uh, big problems. So let me, let me, uh, let me uh, start with a, a few things. And I think, uh, you know, a, a really critical question is, what do we mean by system sustainability? Um, I think getting a common definition across the provinces on that would be great. That would actually force the feds to engage on that topic. And part of, it's, part of it is actually a political or an acceptance sort of definition, but part of it is a, uh, is a financial or value creation definition. Um, I think the, the more we can go towards having uh, health systems that, or you know, the individual provincial systems share common measures, the better we'll do. Uh, I just spent a little bit of time looking at uh, what goes on in Alberta they actually use measures from other provinces to figure out what's going on in Alberta. And I think that's a great step. The more we go to transparent measurement, the more you'll see standardization in the measurement, and the more you have at least a consistent platform for the provinces to engage uh, with the feds and for the feds to engage with the provinces. Uh, I also think that, you know, that the more we go and it's uh, measurements, not the solution for everything, but the more that we go towards measures that show uh, both what's working well, but what the shortfalls are in our system, the stronger uh, the ability the feds have to kind of get back into healthcare in an active way, right? Uh, we've all kind of retreated from that table in many ways, and we end up arguing over kind of, um, you know, tax points or sort of uh, bits of a transfer formula. Uh, it needs to be not only about the money, coming back to the, the you know, one of the things I said right at the beginning, we need to frame these as sort of problems around what it is we want to achieve, not just how much we're going to spend, right? A uh, very good friend of mine says we need to stop thinking about healthcare as a cost center and start to think about it as a value center instead. And uh, sort of a little more about business language on that. Anyways, um, you know, there's there's a lot of other probably kind of more uh, glib or <laughs> maybe funnier comments I could make about how we get the provinces and the federal government working together, but I'll hold those to myself. <laughs> Oh, we wish you wouldn't. <laughs> um, I, I really would like to thank you for um, sharing so much, uh, uh, so much of your wisdom with us in such a short period of time and being very candid about really where we are and, and where we need to get to and, and that we really do have some pretty tough uh, sledding ahead. But, but as I said in introducing you, I'm a real believer. I, I think of myself as a realistic optimist. And, uh, and I do believe that if we can work together across uh, partnerships and across stakeholder groups, I, I really do believe that we can move to an anti-fragile healthcare system where we can take the blows and not only come back from them, but come back better. And, and I think that, I, I don't know if you want to end with a comment about that, but to me, you know, we're, we know as patients that this system had a lot of problems before we started. 
yeah. the pandemic certainly exacerbated them. There's no question and probably created some new ones. But uh, we, we were in a deficit before we started. And I'm not just talking about money. So um, how do we, you know, just maybe in closing, a few optimistic remarks about how we can work together to, uh, to solve this. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I just want to pick up a little bit on the, the theme of resiliency that you raised for a second there, Louise, because I think it's a critical one. Um, you know, it, one of the faculty in my school, uh, I'm sure this is not even their, uh, their point originally, sort of talks about how public health kind of only moves at the speed of trust. Um, we need to do everything that we can to kind of build trust into our system. And this is, and this is I think, you know, not sort of a, uh, a Pollyanna sort of statement, right? Uh, we know that when we look at the integrated care models in the states, uh, the more trust there is between the payer and the providers, the better those models work because they actually have that space to take some risks. They have that space to, <clears throat> I think, you know, do something other than just cower or shrink from whatever kind of blows are coming, right? Or try to manage around it. They can actually take some risks and manage it. So I think something where we're building trust, which is obviously something that involves transparency, it involves inclusiveness, it involves more tables, um, uh, is a really sort of critical step forward. Uh, I think you know, we teach a case study every year uh, on some of you know the, some critical decisions around science and government. Uh, and one of the things we try to leave folks with is this idea that you want open policy. You know, you don't want sort of kind of stuff just showing up and being announced. You want sort of a careful, thoughtful, sort of engaged policy process. Uh, you know, we used to do that. Uh, the British still do a little bit of it with white papers and everything else where it gives folks a chance to kind of comment. But everything that we can do to build trust, I think, would be one of the critical ways to sort of build that forward. Um, and uh, hopefully we can do it. Uh, and if you need an optimistic note, uh, I've, you know, like a lot of folks here, I've been working for decades in healthcare, uh, and I still think it's worth getting up every day and trying to kind of work with folks about making it better. So thank thanks you. again for the chance well, to be here. Well, thank you. We'll be doing some uh, uh, webinars over the next year to prepare for next year's summit, and perhaps we can do one on the issue of trust and how to build trust. That uh, that's probably worth quite a conversation, I'm sure. <laughs> so thank you for your time today. I know how busy you are and uh, really appreciate your candor and your engagement for sure. Great. Good luck with the conference, everyone. Thank you for having thank me today. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. Thank you, Stany. That was fantastic. I took a lot of notes and, <laughs> and have some great quotes coming out of that one. I would love to invite Antonella Scali to the microphone to introduce our panelists for our next part of the agenda. Thanks so much, Leah. Um, I'm Antonella. I'm the executive director of the Canadian Psoriasis Network. And uh, I too took a lot of notes and um, it was very keen that uh, Dean Brown left us on the um, note of trust and on uh, the people who are um, making things happen um, to help ensure that um, there is that trust as we move forward. And so it's my pleasure to introduce our panel um, of presenters today who are part of, the, of those, those people who are making that change and who are critical parts of the communities that um, that we know have had some particular challenges over the last uh, um, couple of years with the pandemic in particular, and of course, before the pandemic. So um, it's my pleasure to introduce our first panel of this year's summit. Um, and just a little bit of background, this panel will explore um, challenges experienced by patient communities that have been exacerbated by the pandemic. So panelists from oncology, chronic disease, and mental health will discuss disruptions in care and treatment and the way forward for these communities. And panelists were also asked to reflect on unique considerations for particular populations that have been disproportionately impacted by these issues. So um, um, Staney did provide really great foundation for some of these issues. And now our panelists who I'll introduce um, we'll take a deeper dive into, uh, into these issues from their particular um, community's perspectives. So our first speaker um, today is uh, Linda Wilhelm. 
Um, Linda has been living with rheumatoid arthritis for over 35 years. She's the founding member of the Canadian Arthritis Patient Alliance, a national volunteer patient-driven organization that, that has worked to improve the lives for people living with arthritis since 2002. She's a patient partner as well on a number of national research networks and a member of the Canadian Pain Task Force. So I, I'm going to introduce all the panelists and then we'll turn it over to Linda to open up the panel for us. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, and I'm lo really looking forward to your um, experience and perspective. Um, and, and we're grateful that you're here. Um, our speaker after Linda will be Dr. Sandy Sadev. Dr. Sadev is a medical oncologist at the Ottawa Hospital Cancer Center, focusing on the treatment of breast, prostate cancers, and melanoma, and leads uh, and lead for the breast cancer site. He also worked at the William Osler Health System for 25 years, and while there, was chief of the Pharmacy and Therapeutics Committee and lead of the Clinical Trials Program in Oncology and Continuing Medical Education in Oncology. Um, he is also, um, just to highlight, a co-founder of the Physician Alliance for Cancer Care and Treatment in Canada, and oncolo an oncologist-led advocacy coalition. So again, a wealth of experience to speak from the oncology perspective. Thank you, Dr. Sadev, for joining us today. And our third panelist, who unfortunately, due to unforeseen circumstances, couldn't join us in person, um, but has done a pre-recorded session for us, is Julia White. Julia is a graduate of Memorial, Memorial University, a registered nurse, and a proud Newfoundlander. She currently works in psychiatric emergency services and has previous experience in women's health, post-anesthesia care, and hematology slash oncology. Julia is currently the 2021 to 2022 Newfoundland and Labrador Network Representative of Jack.org. And for those of you who haven't heard of Jack.org, um, this, the organization is Canada's only charity training young leaders to revolutionize mental health. Um, so um, unfortunately, Julie, again, couldn't make it today, but we do have her pre-recorded session. And we are um, willing to take back questions from the mental health perspective and share it back over the, the next few days if there are any. Um, so in, about Q&A, we'll have each of the panelists present, and then we will have a moderated Q&A with everyone um, on the panel. But I invite Linda, please, to um, get us started by sharing your slides. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, please do pop them into the chat. And again, we'll address them all together as part of the moderated Q&A. I'm just bringing them up here. Here we go. Can everybody see my slides? I'll put it in presenter mode. Looks good. Looking great. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me today. It, uh, I'm glad that, uh, to be able to speak about some of our experiences from my patient community uh, during the pandemic. I have severe rheumatoid arthritis and I uh, was diagnosed in 1983, so I've, uh, I've lived with it for a long time. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge that I live on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Wabanaki, Donland Confederacy, Mi'kmaq, and the Wolostoki, Wasapipak, Malasi. Uh, and I'm privileged to be able to work and live on this land. Uh, and there's no disclosures with regard to this presentation. So CAPA, Canadian Arthritis Patient Alliance, we're a national volunteer organization. We have no full-time employees. All of our board members are people living with arthritis. Uh, we were formed in 2002. We have been providing advice to government and research entities and healthcare providers on policies that impact our health. And I'm a patient partner with the Strategy for Patient-Oriented Research Evidence Alliance Network, uh, as well as the Chronic Pain Network, uh, a former member of the Drug Safety and Effectiveness Network Steering Committee, uh, and I'm current member of the Canadian Pain Task Force and a CIHR Citizens Advisory Committee. Uh, COVID-19, I'm going to kind of split it into two things, 2020 and then 2021. Uh, 2020, I think we were all just, you know, trying to figure out how we were going to navigate this, our healthcare, our, our lives. I know in our community, people with autoimmune disease, um, people were living in fear, uh, increased anxiety, uh, tremendous uncertainty. 
Uh, we didn't know how this COVID-19 would affect uh, many of us with other existing conditions and comorbidities where we've had lots of lung involvement. People think of arthritis, they don't think of it attacking your internal organs, but many of us are living with long-term lung implications from our disease and we just were not sure how we were going to manage this. And so we ended up being isolated. We didn't leave our homes and when we did have to leave our homes, it was just a tremendous stressful experience every time we went out and we were talking to each other online and um, I think with our community it says the, the stress was was just like nothing we had seen ever before um, and, and you know we, we were isolated so that affected our mental health um, and then 2021 we saw uh, the vaccine coming out and I think many of us were given that little bit of glimmer of hope that, you know, this vaccine uh, would, would help us resume some kind of normal life. Um, unfortunately, we got a lot of mixed messaging. We saw in the UK, people with autoimmune conditions were a high priority for vaccination. Our National Advisory Committee on Immunization has recommended that people with autoimmune disease not be immunized because the vaccines were not tested in clinical trials on our populations, which is no surprise because no vaccines are ever tested on our populations. But that really was a difficult thing after a year of isolation and fear and the stress uh, to be managed, you know, to be told that, no, you know, you're not a priority for vaccination. And, um, in, you know, it was just, uh, just something that our population really had trouble trying to manage. And, you know, we, we heard about all these treatments for COVID-19 and, you know, uh, Donald Trump in the States put forward hydroxychloroquine. Uh, which is a drug used by people with rheumatic diseases and for, you know, decades and decades um, and very effective drug. I'm on this medication. Uh, but when uh, it started being touted as a COVID-19 treatment, we were having trouble getting our prescriptions refilled. We were limited to one month at a time. We had lupus patients being told that they couldn't have it, that the supply was being diverted to COVID. And then all this with no evidence to show that uh, hydroxychloroquine was even effective. And then subsequently after we were working with Health Canada to try to manage the shortages and get a dependable supply for our patients, it did came out that the drug was actually not effective at all in COVID-19. So all this additional stress for our patients was for nothing. Uh, and then we had other drugs that Temra was another one that had been and that now being used as a COVID-19 treatment. But again, our patient populations are have been told to, you know, plan for a shortage to, to make sure you're talking to your pharmacy to go in and, and make sure that your supply is guaranteed because even now there's, you know, of the subcutaneous supply and the IV supply, there's challenges getting it. Add to all this, before COVID-19, our patients were never hardly seen virtual. Uh, rheumatology is a very um, specialized field where a lot of it is re relies on looking and manipulating the joints to see how they are, how inflamed they are. But all our care switched to virtual. We also had trouble getting ministries of health to put out billing codes for our specialists so that they could see their patients virtually and we had to do some work with the Ontario Rheumatology Association around accessing virtual care and then we ended up getting in touch with the Canadian Rheumatology Association, Association both over the vaccine issue about how we could try to communicate to NASI that our population should be prioritized for vaccination as well as how we could get uh, get seen virtually and get access to virtual care. So we had many fires that just seemed like we were constantly trying to put out. We get one thing settled and then something else would pop up. And it was just tremendously stressful for our patient population. So our board members actually joined the Canadian Rheumatology Association's Vaccine Guidelines Committee, and they worked together to try to look at, to find the evidence and did a rapid review uh, on evidence to try to get our 
NASI to try to up our prior and that did work and we ended up communicating to NASI about some of the problems that we were living with and they ultimately uh, softened their recommendation. They never came out and said yes we should be a priority population but they did say that it should be back we could receive a vaccination if our doctors felt that it was uh, necessary and the patients were fully informed of the risks and the benefits. Um, we also did a lot to support our patient community. I'm involved with the chronic pain community and these patients were also isolated and tremendous mental health stress and tremendous anxiety. Um, so we ended up booking uh, touch points every month for our community on Zoom so we could connect with each other and, and learn to support each other um, and just to make sure that the patients who were most vulnerable that that were you know having difficulties had somebody monthly that they could talk to and to reach out to and we we share all of that information all the uh, guidelines work that we were doing everything through social media through our newsletter um, we also developed a COVID-19 resource for patients every day uh, and, and rightly so, the, everything was changing on a daily basis. This was so new and the evidence was coming out every day and we were constantly updating this resource for our patients to communicate the latest evidence and the latest vaccine policies so that patients knew what was going on. We worked with the Canadian Rheumatology to develop a vaccine decision aid based on the guidelines work and the rapid review work. We also worked with them on best practices in virtual care. Um, with a, had about five or six patients working on that with them, which was something that really positive that came out with COVID-19 was we never really worked a lot with our specialists before COVID-19. They kind of did their thing, we did our thing. Um, and now this, the COVID, the issues that we were dealing with over the last year and a half has brought us together and formed some really solid relationships and has built that trust. Uh, we also had patients join the COVID end on communicating the patient priorities for our community for research and to try to fill in that knowledge gap so we got very active and very busy and very engaged through virtual um, and a return to normal. Um, I, you know, I hear say about the wait times and, and our previous speaker spoke about the wait times and the wait times for tests, the wait times for surgery. Well, you know, joint replacements are elective surgeries, but I can tell you as somebody who's had 14 of them, not one of them was elective. The last surgery I had, I walked around on a broken hip for six weeks because I didn't realize it was broken and excruciating pain, not sleeping, you can't sit, you can't do anything but wait for the surgery. And you know, that's that's your life. You, you know, it, it's considered an elective surgery, but these surgeries are life-changing and life-transforming and return people to active living and you know, hopefully to return them to work. But the longer they wait for these new hip replacements, the less chances they're going to get back to work. We heard a little bit about the long COVID and the patients and the burdens that are going to come to the healthcare system from the effects of COVID-19 uh, on a system that really was not doing well before COVID-19. And I think about our healthcare providers and how hard they've worked the last year and a half and, and some of the attacks that they've been getting and the protests that go on outside of hospitals and you know the, the, my appreciation for what they're trying to do and, and really a difficult situation. And then I have to ask the question, do I want normal back? And, and really, I, you know, I think our previous speaker again and Louise alerted to it, I don't know that I want normal back. I want better than what normal was. I want to see our system improved so people can get access to the treatments that they need and, you know, maybe someday at some point to redefine what elective surgery is. Um, and then again, you know, the positive impacts that have come out of this, you know, the, the rapid shift to virtual care, I can't tell you how great it was not to have to go in and trudge the hour or the 45 minute drive and wait for an hour in a waiting room exposed to not just COVID-19, but the colds and flus and all of those things that make some of this chronic illness that much sicker. Uh, to be able to get a refill on a prescription now virtually was just incredible. Um, our improved collaboration with our specialist, our rheumatologist, has been a huge positive impact from COVID-19. Uh, just the fact that now I think employers 
you know, we'll acknowledge that when people are sick and they're not well, they should be able to stay home from work and not have to push themselves to go to work. And then with our community, with a lot of people being disabled, that shift to be able to do some work balance, to be able to work from home, uh, the accommodation for people with disabilities, which is makes, you know, going out to, to work sometimes difficult for them. Um, and so these are, you know, some of the positive impacts that we've had from COVID-19. And I'll end my presentation now and stop sharing as soon as I can find the arrow. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Linda. You gave us a lot to think about. Um, and um, I can't wait to get back to questions and answers for you because I think Kappa is a great example of how the patient community um, really came together and um, navigated their way through this and on these, these uncertainties and came up with some really great key learnings that we can all take forward. So thank you so much. Uh, and it's again with great pleasure that I um, turn it over to Dr. Sadev for his portion of this panel. Yes, thank you. I'll see. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a Mac, so I'm on my work PC. I hope this works out for us. Let's see if you can see my screen. Can you see that? Yes, we can. Thank you so much. Just perfect. Good. How do you see it now in presenter view? Looks great. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. So thank you also for inviting me. Uh, I learned a lot from the previous two speakers especially, and I've been learning a lot from our patients. I hope to share with you some general observations before our full discussion. So this is just to set the stage. This is a very actively researched area. How, would, how did COVID affect cancer care? What was the impact both psychologically and medically on the outcome of our patients? And I've listed some seminal publications over the last one here, just for your interest to set the stage. But one big impact we've all noticed in the beginning is marked fluctuations in our patient volumes. We actually budget in our clinics for an expected volume of patients based upon previous years and demographics. And because of delays in diagnosis and access to screening tests, for example, being curtailed, the government in Ontario stopped even sending reminders to healthy women that you're due for a mammogram, for example. So they kind of really fell off the, um, uh, off the plate uh, for many patients. Ultrasounds were tremendously delayed. And as part of a workup for breast cancer, for example, it caused often a month or two delay for patients getting diagnosed. There was tremendous fear of testing, fear of exposure to COVID in the early days, despite the fact that the hospitals tended to be by far cleaner than most uh, grocery stores and other uh, places people were going to. So we had trouble matching our manpower to the need. There are massive surges and voids of new patient volumes. Uh, in the beginning, we had a decrease in volumes of our patients that later led to an increased surge when the diagnoses came afterwards. We also did indeed see more advanced disease of presentation. Patients were frightened to see doctors, they downplayed their symptoms, they weren't being screened. And by the time a cancer came to diagnosis with symptoms or more overt signs, uh, it was often larger. So we give the example, we call them the T stage, the tumor size was often larger when first found instead of being uh, picked up incidentally on a scan. Patients with locally advanced cancers often have a much poorer prognosis than those that are caught early. We had a big impact on clinical trials. The, the access for our patients in Canada to trials was really put on hold because clinical trials coordinators and support staff were not able to come into the hospital to support the operations of studies. And clinical trials in Canada aren't just about getting access to experimental and new therapies. They are a way for our patients to access costly drugs that in Canada take one or two years longer than they should to get funded and available to our patients uh, through routine mechanisms. There's tremendous psychic distress, and I don't, shouldn't underplay this. Uh, the staff was tremendously worried about their own safety, their own families, or the ability to cope if they suddenly had to be off work for a positive test or an exposure. Um, doctors were very anxious for our patients presenting with more advanced stages of diseases. There was tremendous uncertainty, more so in the pre-vaccine era that wasn't that long ago. And for inpatients in hospital, we had this really sad situation, the patients coming in without COVID, but sometimes leaving with it or dying of it because of exposures, thankfully very rarely, but they did happen. On the bottom right, you can see a table that was uh, set up by the government where we all had to spend hours every night before clinics to try to triage all of our patients preemptively because if we had to shut down or there were staff shortages, we had to identify what patients could selectively be deferred or canceled and what uh, should not be. And that posed a lot of distress for us. 
For early disease patients, there were disease uh, delays in surgical treatments. We had to invent new uh, approaches to bridging patients to control their cancers, sometimes with hormonal therapy or chemotherapy, to buy them time until they could have definitive surgery. We often give chemotherapy before surgery, in, for example, in breast cancer and rectal cancer. The application was unchanged, but we did it more often because patients were presenting with larger tumors. And adjuvant chemo, chemo, chemo given after surgery to prevent death from spread later was being utilized less because patients were frightened of lowering their immune systems in this new COVID era. So more might die of disease recurrence. In the metastatic disease setting where patients often are not curable, we were shifting to more hormonal therapies for prostate and breast cancer as opposed to chemotherapy. I was really impressed, thank frankly though, with the resilience of patients realizing that the most important treatment for them was the best one for their cancer. So we didn't see a lot of patients refusing chemo where it was felt to be optimal. But there was tremendous uncertainty about the safety and we really had difficulty evaluating patients who were doing things virtually. We really couldn't tell whether they really fit for treatment or not without an in-person assessment in the early days. Virtual care did provide benefits, as mentioned in my last bullet here. I think hopefully it will stay. To have to come in an hour and a half or two hours just to discuss a test result may not be necessary, but it also caused tremendous disconnect from patients in the early days. In cancer, we really, really rely upon that um, feeling of trust and of understanding of each other's perspectives when we, when we have a relationship with our patients. Um, often they were, were seen virtually, they were booked for treatment, and when they came in, they were found to be too sick by the nurses in clinic, you know, to have treatment and we had to change our whole plan. And it was really distressing that they could not come in with relatives. They need their families present as an extra pair of ears to understand their treatments, understand the approach, what side effects to watch for. With all the stress of cancer, usually it's hard for patients to take everything in. And we really miss that. And now we're, thankfully we're getting back with families coming in again. The inpatients, not just the risk of dying of COVID, but when they're in the hospital dealing with difficult cancer, emergencies, complications, toxicities, or end of life care, being isolated from their relatives was really um, uh, really uh, heartbreaking to see uh, as caregivers and, and physicians and nurses. Um, the teamwork issue also was an issue. We, we really rely upon family doctors as part of our teams to do interval assessments, home visits, to assess patients between our assessments, and they were not really providing routine access to visits. Home care was quite limited. I even had an in-law uh, in, in southwestern Ontario die of lung cancer at home. And even though her daughter was a social worker, they were unable to get home care. And thankfully for her, she didn't have a long period of a final decline or suffering. She passed away fairly quickly and the family was able to cope. To this day, we're having trouble getting home care quickly for our patients. My last slide is just to show some graphic information. This was a study from McGill looking at mathematical modeling, predicting what the impact might be on mortality from cancer over the next roughly 10 years. And it's based upon the, um, on the top left, you can see there were fewer cancers diagnosed in the early part of the COVID era, more coming in later as they finally hit, hit the diagnostic stage and came to us at a later stage. But this is going to impact long-term outcomes. If you take the base case that there's a 1.06 hazard ratio, so a 6% increased risk in mortality from cancer if the diagnosis is delayed by two weeks. And you look at the delays we're actually seeing, we expect there may be, let's say assuming we don't even have any loss of capacity, a 396,000 life year loss over the next 10 years from the cancers that we've been having diagnosed coming to us too late. On the right, we can see it broken down by different disease uh, subtypes. Um, but it, it is going to have a tremendous impact on the delay in diagnosis because of screening, availability, access to screening technologies, and that's going to hit us for years to come. So with that, uh, thank you for your attention, and I, I look forward to our discussion. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Sadev. Those those numbers were very stark at the end of your presentation. So, so thank you for um, giving us a lot to think about. Um, we will get back. We have some questions already coming in through the chat. So thank you. Um, I, I turn it over to my experts and colleagues um, at Axon um, to help us launch the recording, the pre-recording of our third and final panelists for today. Um, so hopefully we can get that video going and, um, and we can pivot if not, but um, 
we'll see if we can get the, the, the video going and, and finish up the panel and do some uh, Q&A together with Linda and Dr. Sadev. Just a reminder to everyone too, as, um, as our, our colleagues are, are assisting with this, um, if you have questions, please pop them in the chat. You can send them uh, for everyone. You can direct message me as the moderator um, and we'll again, be sure to get to as many as possible. Uh, if we do have any questions from the mental health presentation that we're gonna review, um, again, we'll do our best to get answers and, and present back um, what we learn over the course of the rest of the summit um, because we don't have our third speaker here live with us. Thanks for everyone for your patience as we um, get the video launched on our end. I do have a quick question for Dr. Sadev. Thank you, Sharon. We can get, we can definitely address it as we wait. Oh, okay. Yeah, while we wait. Um, can you suggest a way to alleviate some of these bottlenecks? Sorry about my typo there, but, um, you know, the fact that, that we're putting off some of these, uh, you know, in terms of COVID and some of these other um, issues. I don't have an easy answer. Uh, Dr. Jean Seeley is one of our radiology leads here. I think it's really been a radiology and OR issue, uh, not a medical oncology issue, but it's certainly affecting us. I think we really we need we need commitment from governments to add resources. Uh, there are there's a backlog of of tens of thousands of scans that needed to be done in the last one year that have been bumped, maybe for follow up of something we think is benign but needs an annual review. They weren't felt to be high priority. We need to ramp up our options for you know late time, 24 hour access to scans, uh, operating budgets to accommodate that backlog. Uh, right now, if we have patients with cancer where we have to do scans to see how their cancer is responding to therapy, even they're being bumped back uh, too long. And unfortunately, we are really facing a deficit of access to technology uh, for cancer really uh, in Ontario, at least for years before we had COVID. And now this has been greatly exacerbated. I think there have been efforts from patient groups liaising with government to really emphasize the need for, uh, you know, for this kind of emergency access to enhanced um, um, resources. Thanks so much, Dr. Sadev. Um, and actually on that point, um, maybe as we wait for uh, our tech piece to uh, pop up, Linda, I can direct a question to you if that's okay. Um, how, how would patient engagement have helped alleviate some of these issues for your community and patients in general? Um, do you have any perspectives that you could share on, on yeah. that? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, initially, I think if uh, NACI, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization, if they had had some kind of way to facilitate uh, patient input into their decision making, um, they would have understood that like, even our own rheumatologists when uh, and it was Don and Lori were on the rapid review, um, they didn't even fully understand you know, what goes on in their own patients, you know, like, they were so, they thought we were all so afraid to get vaccinated because the vaccine might, might, might cause a small flare in our disease. We weren't really concerned about small flares because we managed those our whole lives. I mean, that, that's our life. We've lived with this disease for 40 years. You know, I could wake up tomorrow and not hardly be able to move. I know I have to manage that for a couple of days. And if the vaccine caused that, which it did, then you know, I, I try to plan my life and I will say, okay, for the next couple of days, I'm gonna just kind of relax and take it easy. And then I come out of it and I'm protected against COVID-19. We were far more scared, most patients were far more scared 
of COVID-19 and what did end up in the hospital on a theater. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, during some of the really bad times during COVID, we were scared about the, the triage protocols. You know, you know, somebody like me who's got, you know, lung involvement um, presents to a hospital with somebody who's, you know, 21 and perfectly healthy, you know, and there's only two ventilators there, you know, who's going to get that ventilator? And, you know, we had really frank discussions in our community about, you know, do I really want to go on a ventilator? Do I want to, you know, see what's going to happen with long-term COVID for the next, you know, 10 years of my life? And, you know, there's just such horrible, hard conversations that had to happen, I think, where you, if you don't include the patient in those conversations, I, you just don't get the full picture. You have a whole piece of it that's completely missing and patients' priorities don't always, and like in our community, line up with what the specialists believe. Thank you so much, Linda. Such great perspectives and great examples of like precisely the kind of thinking that the patient perspective brings into these conversations. Um, and as we, as we address those backlogs that Dr. Sidev spoke about, how important it is to ensure that those values are being integrated into our thinking. So thank you. Um, it, I've gotten word that our video should be good to go. So I am going to pause Q&A just so that we kind of stay on schedule for people who might be stepping away from their computer uh, and, and want to be back for Q&A. Um, so um, thank you, Melissa. I, if, if we're ready, um, can we go ahead and play uh, Julia White's presentation? And then we'll, we'll go back to some questions. Hello everyone, welcome to the summit. Hello everyone, welcome to the summit. Uh, my name is Julia White. I'm a network representative of Jack.org. I'm very grateful to have been uh, involved in this summit today. Unfortunately, due to some unforeseen circumstances, um, it has to be a virtual video on my end, but um, maybe at some point in the future, I can be uh, live there with you. So a little bit about me. Um, as I mentioned, I'm a network representative of Jack.org specifically for Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, which I would like to uh, recognize uh, is the cultural and ancestral homelands of the Beothic, um, as well as the Mi'kmaq. And I acknowledge that Labrador is a traditional and ancestral homelands of the Inuit of Natasinan, the Inuit of Nunatsiavut, and the Inuit of Nunatukavut. Um, in my professional life, I work as a registered nurse. I have a background working in hematology and oncology, uh, as well as women's health, perioperative and day surgery. Uh, and now I work in psychiatric emergency services, which I have worked in for the last year, um, relates very well to my volunteering with Jack.org. And I'm also involved with the Mood Disorder Society of Canada. So uh, I have lots of experience in the mental health field. Uh, so what is Jack.org? We say that we are young leaders revolutionizing mental health. Um, so Jack.org is a national uh, charity which undertakes the youth first, inclusive, impact focused um, view of, of our um, work. We are impatient for change and we are Canada's only charity that is training and empowering young leaders to revolutionize mental health in every province and territory. Um, so I'm lucky enough to be coming to you from Newfoundland and Labrador, and there are um, 13 representatives, um, such as myself, from across uh, different provinces in the country. So who are we? We have Jack Chapters, Jack Talks, Network Representatives, which is my role, uh, and we have Jack Summits as well. So Jack Talks are professionally trained and certified youth speakers that use the power of personal stories to inspire, engage, educate, and equip young people to take action in their communities. These occur virtually and in person at schools in pre-pandemic times, um, as well as events and different community groups. Jack chapters are usually connected to a university, a high school, or maybe a community group, uh, and they involve trained youth-led groups that work year-round to identify and dismantle barriers to positive mental health in their communities. 
I know that within my community, there is uh, one that's connected to our university here as well as several uh, that are connected to high schools in the area. Uh, and Jack summits, they occur locally, regionally, and nationally. They're youth-led conferences, um, such as this personal virtual summit that we're attending today. Um, they are designed to connect young mental health advocates and build their leadership and advocacy skills so they can implement real strategies for change. Most recently, we had the Atlantic Jack Summit, which I attended uh, virtually this past weekend. Um, so that brought together delegates from all the Atlantic provinces um, and we had keynote speakers. There was a musical performance, workshops and collaboration sessions. Um, and once a year, the national summit uh, happens as well, virtually for the past year um, and hopefully somewhat in person um, the next year. So the Youth Voice Report is um, a report put together by JAG.org every year, and the purpose is to elevate the voices of young people in Canada. Um, so that covers several topics, um, so, such as the state of mental health in Canada, including information from Stats Canada and other mental health organizations. Um, it covers information that's gathered from the JAG.org network. Um, and th that would be gathered through regional and national summits, chapters, and from the network representatives. Uh, and then it also provides some in information on challenges and recommendations. So most recently, the findings of the 2020 Youth Voice Report found that some challenges included academic stress, about 94% of post-secondary survey respondents reported that academic stress creates mental health struggles for them and their peers. Uncertainty about digital mental health services, which as we know, we significantly relied on during the course of the pandemic. 37% um, of respondents reported accessing digital mental health services during COVID-19, compared to 57% accessing mental health services generally before the pandemic. Um, and only 44% said that they believe digital health services would meet their mental health needs. And the last challenge that was identified was difficulty finding the right fit. 61% of Jack.org survey respondents believe that there are few resources to support those struggling with their mental health in their community. And an even higher number, which was 65%, believe that there is a lack of culturally sensitive resources available. Uh, so some of the recommendations that were identified included encouraging the use of teaching practices that support student well-being, help young people access and navigate online mental health services, and to increase the availability of culturally appropriate mental health services. So in supporting student well-being, they have suggested that mental health breaks be provided in class, uh, mental health resources be shared with students, especially at moments of stress or transition. As we know, exam season is uh, one of those high stress moments for students. Um, facilitate dialogue about mental health, which I'm lucky enough to have witnessed on campus when I was a student, um, and consider grading and assessment policies that increase flexibility. So for the next recommendation, navigating online services, uh, the Youth Voice Report has recommended that um, peculiar communication with youth, youth about available services is prioritized. Um, to consider and address inequities in internet access, to look at digital services as a key uh, complement in a suite of care options, to collect more data on youth perceptions, youth barriers, and outcomes to digital services, um, and involve youth voices in the design and development of services, which is what Jack.org is all about. And the last recommendation, the availability of culturally appropriate services, uh, establish clear referral pathways and provide a wider scope of culturally appropriate resources for youth. Um, bring in a wider range of voices to the table when developing and making decisions about resources. Invest in community-based emergency response teams to replace police as first responders to mental health crises. So these are all recommendations that have been taken from what youth had said at summits, in the chapters, and uh, throughout the Jack Talks as well. So what can we do? Uh, it's certainly very important to learn about the resources available in your community. Obviously, we can't 
advocate for something that you know we don't know if it's available or not um, reach out to local change makers so sometimes this might look like local politicians it might look like healthcare providers it might look like advocates that are already established in the community um, and listen and amplify voices of those who interact with the mental health system which is extremely important of course this is what this um, virtual patient health summit is all about is amplifying the voices of people who use these services so thank you very much for having me today i hope that you guys really enjoy the rest of the summit and uh, take care thanks okay well i'll still thank julia in her absence for um the presentation and I think one of the big things for us was really also introducing Jack.org as um, an, a fantastic resource for um, the voice of young people in this uh, particular context because it's been uh, there have been so many challenges for that particular group and and we know from the from Linda's presentation and Dr. Sadev's presentation that mental health has of course been an extraordinary challenge for our community so um, again unfortunately Julie couldn't be here but um, we are so lucky to be able to kind of engage with them as well as we move forward in, in some of the work uh, the summit work that we'll be doing um, so we are going to spend a few more minutes on questions uh, that we didn't get to before Julia's uh, presentation. Um, one of the things that uh, Julia talked about was getting the amplifying voices. And Linda talked about this as well in terms of um, ensuring that the patient voices are at, you know, in integrated in what we do. Um, Dr. Siddhav, this can be a big challenge. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna pose this question to you first. One of the things that Linda had mentioned was um, about elective surgeries and how you know, that definition can be problematic in how patients view these things and how, um, and how traditionally, clinically, we, we look at these things and how we've been um, defining this. So how can we get policy and decision makers to understand a real definition of elective elective surgeries. Um, Louise posed this question and she mentioned that she heard a doctor on CBC say they've been defining everything other than COVID related treatment as elective. So any comments on that from you and then I'll turn it over to Linda. Yeah, I mean, it's very interesting, you know, if you look at what happened in Italy, if you recall, Italy had a big problem with COVID in the early days, but they didn't delay any cancer operations. And in fact, they rapidly worked together across boundaries to establish one hospital as the lead for all cancer work to make sure it didn't get disrupted. Uh, and they had the worst flare at the early days of COVID. So I think getting back to the previous speaker, talking about the need to better have you know, better collaboration between levels of government, between governments of different hospitals to help to you know, uh, handle these, uh, these issues. In our cities, in our city of Ottawa, we actually talked about maybe in the future, developing a program where several of the key uh, community hospitals would take the lead and continue to operate on cancers nonstop and even take surgical cases from the downtown academic center that was the COVID hub to help to, you know, help to rationalize our resources. It never had to happen because things got better fast enough. But for a while, you know, all the cancer operations were called elective unless the operation was dealing with something that would otherwise kill the patient within seven days. Now, most, cancer most cancers don't have that imminent threat of death within seven days. So every cancer was called elective. And we really struggled, you know, thankfully with um, tumor board meetings, with committees of doctors together saying this was truly urgent. We were able to override that case by case, but it was a lot of work and very stressful. So I think in the future, we should have kind of emergency systems in place to better handle that kind of disruption again. Thank you so much. And um, Linda, I, I'll, I'll turn it over to you to see if you had anything to add to uh, Dr. Sidev's perspective from a uh, patient group um, perspective. Well, you know, from my disease group, and you know, I talk, you know, joint replacement surgery is is front and center, and and uh, you know, the the wait times before COVID 
were really poor. Like they just, there was a focus on uh, wait times, you know, with the 2005 health accord and things kind of got under control a little bit. And they, some new, you know, innovative models of central triaging came out. Um, and those things are, are still kind of happening in the background. But I just, I think we need to change our definition of elective surgery. Um, you know, there's no question cancer surgeries are critical and you know, people will die. Um, but, you know, I've said for a long time that sometimes there's worse things than dying. And, you know, when you think about some of the, what, what our patients live through and, you know, I've been there, I know what it's like to wait for a hip replacement. And, you know, the one time was over a year. The last time was about five months, but, uh, you know, it's, it's a very, very awful time. So, you know, but technically I've lost, you know, you know, a couple of years of my life waiting for a joint replacement surgery that I could have been with my grandchildren that, you know, that I could have spent, you know, enjoying my life, you know, living with RA for 40 years has not been a picnic. And so every day that I can have where I can enjoy life is important to me. Um, and I just, I just want to see at some point governments have a look of what they're, what they call elective surgery. Somebody who's, you know, 50 years old, um, with, who needs a knee replacement and is off work because the pain's so excruciating, they can't function. You know, they, they need to be a priority because we want to get them back to work. We can save the system healthcare dollars. But again, you know, when the, the you know, the doctor at the beginning, Steiny, I don't want to get his name right. But I mean, he said, you know, that, uh, you know, the, just the, the priorities of what these surgeries are and, you know, what we just need to get a handle on how we're going to make patients and how we're going to treat patients going forward. Thank you. And yes. Um, Stanley Brown, he did talk about changing our perspective. He quoted someone from a cost center to a value center and how we look at these things um, differently. Um, so thank you both. I, I have another question for the panel. Um, and actually, Ju Julia mentioned that less than half of people, I think she said 47% of the youth in the survey that they did agreed that virtual care would meet their mental health needs. This is very interesting because we've seen so much, especially from the mental health uh, sector, um, be provided online, which is great. Um, but of course, um, we know that that's not the panacea. And, and so from, um, I turn it over to maybe starting with Linda this time, um, how do you think virtual care will be optimally used going forward for cancer slash arthritis communities? I hope that there's going to be a mix of virtual and in-person. I, I haven't seen my rheumatologist for almost two years because she's on mat leave. And then the, with the pandemic and her being on mat leave, um, you know, it, that's a long time to go for somebody like me who's got such advanced disease without seeing my specialist. My next appointment, I will request to be in person um, just because of that. I, I don't want to, I'm not a doctor. I don't, I want to know from her perspective, you know, do, well, how am I doing from when she saw me two years ago? Because I think there's, you know, if she sees a difference, we need to figure that out. Um, you know, virtual care has been good for me, but I also think we need to make sure that there is going to be that mix because for some things, obviously, it doesn't work for, for everything. And, and we need to know, you know, there needs to be some guidance and guidelines and, you know, the, the research needs to be done. And we just, we need to, you know, because I think it can be a huge help for people living in remote areas, people who are disabled and, and have difficult getting out, uh, things like renewals of prescriptions. I used to have to go to my doctor for a renewal for prescriptions that I've been on for 20 years because would, you wouldn't do it virtually. Well, that's a, that's a waste of my time. It's a waste of his time. You know, so let's get, make sure that resources, healthcare resources are used appropriately. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, for cancer, nothing replaces seeing our patients, seeing how they're doing, what their functional status is. But if it's just to discuss a blood test or to discuss you know, your blood test is okay, move on with your second round of treatment, virtual care is really good for that. Um, patients really appreciate that. We have well, a large geographic area we're serving, but I've been really struck with how many patients actually you know, prefer coming in. They actually tell us, so oh, I'd like to see you in person. I feel more reassured when I get a thorough assessment. 
And the Zoom, Zoom has been integrated into our electronic medical system. So we can click a button, launch Zoom. And I think it's actually better than the phone. I can see someone's facial expression. I can look at the expression of their spouse and what's really happening by, in, at the family and their home. Uh, so they all actually have a role and we're trying to define that better. I get a bit upset when many doctors, at least patients perceive, will not see them in person, not for their sake to avoid COVID because they don't want to open their offices. And as you know, there's been a memo sent by the provincial government to all doctors in Ontario uh, a few weeks ago saying really it's your obligation to see patients in person and you can't kind of block that. Many patients of mine tell me their family doctor won't see them in person. They only do phone visits and they don't realize if they make the phone visit and the problem is identified that needs to be seen in person, that will happen. But lots of regular medical things are not being addressed properly because of that barrier. So I think finding that right mix and uh, also enforcing, you know, the responsibility of doctors to care for their patients properly, that'll be the challenge. Thank you so much. Um, we do have another question. Um, we have a time for a couple more. Um, how do we bring back experienced healthcare staff back to ER rooms after they, they have been trained in the intensive care? Um, big question about how we, I guess, move back um, to um, supporting our healthcare, um, our, our healthcare sector in, in transitioning back to um, changing our focus back to managing some of these bottlenecks and supporting people. Um, any comments on this one uh, from you, Dr. Sadev? Uh, it, it's been an issue facing my colleagues and we're all so busy with our own silos. I've not looked at that in depth, but talking to my colleagues in different centers, not so much Ottawa, but for example, Brampton, um, Maritimes, uh, we also serve the Inuit population in Ottawa for cancer needs. You know, I've seen the impact in smaller rural hospitals, especially where they haven't got the resources. It's not just a matter of, I think, of hazard pay, you know, for the staff that often comes up as part of the discussion, but the staff have to feel safe and supported and, and they can't be burnt out. Uh, if you exhaust the ability of your staff physically and emotionally to deal with their workload, you know, they will not come to work. And we've seen that happen in nursing homes and chronic care facilities. So I think that really is not just a political and financial issue. It's also just the, you know, the structure of the care you can provide and uh, also the resources for emotional support, uh, for wellness for the staff to make sure they feel adequately supported. It's a big deal though. Uh, and as more and more staff sometimes have to call in sick all of a sudden because their relatives have had a positive test and they have to be in isolation, it has this immense sudden chain effect that we have trouble you know, compensating for on the fly. Uh, I think eventually mass vaccination, herd immunity, if we ever achieve that uh, and getting the numbers down will be the ultimate solution. Thank you. Linda, Linda, did you have anything to add to this discussion? Yeah, you know, prior to COVID, I think there was, you know, we, we had human resource issues with healthcare before COVID. So COVID has exacerbated it. My daughter's a nurse and I just, I watched with the stress that she went under for the last year and a half. And she's also got four children under the age of eight. So these people have lives as well. And, you know, they, they, they're trying to balance, you know, their profession and taking care of their patients with their personal lives and the personal stresses and kids, you know, homeschooling, trying to, you know, school her kids. She's trying to teach your kids in the morning and go to work for a night shift at night so I think it's just a matter we need to figure out how we're going to support this I, I you know I said you know the next couple of years we're going to see a huge increase in people needing mental health uh, supports because you know I know just our own patient community that the stresses that they've been on and I I don't think the system's anywhere near capable of handling what's going to come at it I, I just don't think it is. So I think we need to get creative. Thank you so much. And thank you for raising that question because I think it's important for us all to keep that in mind as we're talking about solutions and just, you know, what we're, what the actual people who are doing this work are, are going through in doing that. Um, so we have just another minute left before I introduce our next speaker. Um, to, to leave us on, an, on a, a, again, a, an action point, as we tried to earlier with, uh, with Steeny, our first speaker, um, you both talked a lot about um, 
lessons learned and actual like we framed it as positives maybe even uh, that we we gained from from our learnings from the from the pandemic um, if you can um, think about one thing uh, that you want to see as standard practice moving forward and maybe a word on how patients can be part of that solution um, not to put you on the spot to pick one thing but any any last word um, that you want to give in, in terms of like how we move solutions forward. Uh, maybe Linda, you, you shared a bunch. Yeah, I'm going to pull out of uh, the chat and then Louise Binder posted in there about the revamp of NASI. I think that uh, what we've seen the last year and a half has made it very clear that there needs to be some changes there, that they need help and they need to better engage um, with patients to even the, the messaging delivering. I mean, many of us who are knowledgeable and understand the system understood why that evidence was changing every day, but the average Canadian, that just casts doubt on the whole science and the evidence development of the whole process. So I think that, yeah, I'd like to see the revamp of NASI to be more patient-centered and to be more engaged beyond their own circle. Yeah, for me, I think it's really hard to pinpoint the one thing. I think just the tremendous learnings we've had in the last year and a half, uh, all about agility and resiliency of the systems to adapt quickly, of medical teams to come together, to have international consensus, what cancer things can wait, what cannot wait, what we should do in the meantime, that collaboration around it. Uh, be also the reflection on now we know that certain things don't have to all be cancelled. Now we know how to develop rapid vaccines and how to approve them more quickly. I think that whole package will, will be very important for us moving forward. Uh, how, to, how to quickly uh, uh, rationalize our resources, use them correctly uh, and efficiently. We've learned a lot from that and I think that'll really help us next time. And I have an un uh, un unfortunate feeling there will be a next time. I was part of SARS when it hit Toronto before, and then I reflect back on that a lot. Thank you very much um, for leaving us on that note. And I know the the Lindas, the Louises will lead the lead the way in in bringing those um, points forward to NASI. Um, so thank you so much um, to you both. Um, we you've given us a lot to think about in our working session later on, um, and we appreciate your time and expertise. And uh, with working with you going forward as we move on some of these action pieces. So thank you. Um, so it's my pleasure to turn it over to our final presenter of the day. I invite uh, Dr. Craig Earl to um, please, hello, nice to see you, um, share, share your camera and, your, and, and get started on your slides. I'll, I'll give a very brief introduction um, to Dr. Earl. His full bio is in our, on our, um, Summit landing page, but uh, Dr. Craig Earl is incoming Chief Executive Officer, effective, oh, it's, it's effective, <laughs> um, it, on November 1st um, at the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer, a medical oncologist at Sunnybrook Sedet Cancer Center in Toronto, a senior scientist at the Institute for Clinical Evalu Evaluative Sciences, and a professor of medicine at the University of Toronto. So a wealth of information from him to talk about COVID-19's effect on cancer care innovation through the pandemic. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's uh, my absolute pleasure and, and privilege to be able to uh, spend today with you. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, well, the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer, but in the context of the Canadian strategy for cancer control. You've heard already quite a bit about the effect of the pandemic uh, on cancer, so I won't dwell on that too, too much. But I will talk a bit about what we, the partnership, are doing about it. So first, just about the strategy. Uh, if you go back to 2006, Canada was actually one of the first countries in the world to have a, nat a national strategy for cancer control. And probably even more importantly was that in 2007, the federal government uh, created the Canadian Partnership uh, Against Cancer, CPAC, to be the steward of that strategy. So actually putting organization and finance behind uh, the strategy. <clears throat> so, in the uh, years since, there have been uh, many things that we've been working on. For example, we helped several jurisdictions uh, create organized colorectal cancer screening programs. Um, we've been involved in getting uh, tobacco cessation 
programs in now almost every cancer center in the country. We've done a lot of work on measuring patient reported outcomes during uh, cancer care and also providing uh, infrastructure support for clinical trials uh, to increase access for patients. In uh, 2018, the federal health minister asked CPAC to refresh the strategy. And so in 2019, uh, the new uh, refreshed Canadian strategy for cancer control was released. And, and the main differences uh, from the previous one, first of all, was that the theme, the overarching theme throughout this strategy is to increase equitable access to quality cancer care. So a real focus on equity. And one example of that is you'll see there are eight priorities uh, here. And the first five are the typical things that were in the original strategy about prevention and screening and survivorship, et cetera. But the last three are people-specific Indigenous strategies around culturally appropriate care closer to home, uh, people-specific self-determined priorities, and Indigenous governed research and data systems uh, around cancer. So this is uh, a slide outlining the type of things that you know, mostly people have talked about before. I'll maybe start a step earlier and say that prevention has also been uh, impact quite a bit uh, related to cancer. And one very concrete example of that is HPV vaccination programs, as well as hepatitis programs in school have essentially been stopped. And uh, these are you know, the main purpose is to prevent uh, cancer for those. But as well, as has been discussed, there's been um, people afraid, understandably, to interact with the healthcare system, come forward with systems with symptoms. Uh, our screening programs were essentially shut down across the country for four or five months after the pandemic uh, started. They've mostly restarted, although not all back at, uh, at full capacity. And then uh, diagnostics. So imaging biopsies, one area that's been very much impacted has been any sort of endoscopic procedures. So I'm a gastrointestinal oncologist, colonoscopies, but also head and neck and uh, respiratory because uh, those are really affected by COVID protocols around distancing, screening, uh, uh, et cetera. And so of course, as Dr. Sedev was pointing out, uh, the fear with all of this is that uh, it will lead to later stage cancers, which require more treatment, more intense, more complicated treatment, and unfortunately expecting that the outcomes uh, can be worse. Uh, and as well as uh, Staney mentioned, you know, the pandemic has not been uh, fair in its distribution. And so there's also concerns about increasing disparities with all of these effects. So in this slide, just showing some of the impacts in primary care, emergency room visits, there's similar graphs around surgery, just showing, uh, you know, 50% fewer uh, uh, visits to primary care. And headlines that all show that the estimates right now are that there are approximately 20% fewer cancer cases diagnosed in 2020 uh, in the early parts of the, the pandemic. And it's not that cancer went away, unfortunately. It's that these are cancers that people have been walking around with uh, and uh, will you know, come and present and are presenting now. I think we're already seeing it. Which leads me to this next slide, which is from the same study that Dr. Sedev showed. It's a, a different graph, but showing here in blue, these are the, the diagnoses. So showing how during the pandemic, big uh, decrease from the baseline normal, which is this line. And then we're now starting to see what's anticipated to be a big uh, surge in new cases. And unfortunately, here are the expected uh, increased deaths uh, expected to come over the next few years. This is a, a slide that uh, Dr. Sedev showed. Um, I'm actually gonna point out a different line in it though. He was pointing about this one uh, about with our current capacity. I think quite uh, interestingly, if you get down to this line, this is the line that shows what can happen if we just have a 10% increase in our capacity 
for two or three years that we can really have a big uh, mitigate the effects of the pandemic. And so the, the challenge or the question is how to be able to, uh, to do that. We know that, uh, for example, in Ontario, the government has announced funding more beds, funding for surgeries to be done on evenings and weekends. And that's great, it's a start, we need that sort of thing. The limiting factor, unfortunately, has been health human resources. We know there's a lot of burnout, as Dr. Seda was just saying, in the system. Nursing in particular uh, is uh, a major uh, issue. So, so a lot of challenges in terms of how we can get to that fairly modest uh, surge in capacity that could really help mitigate things. So in these next slides, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what we've been doing during the pandemic to, to try to help with this issue. And this is all work that, uh, first of all, I'll say we've had patient and family advisors embedded in, in all of our work uh, and doing everything we can to make sure that that's meaningful engagement and constantly looking at it to try to, you know, currently we're looking, how can we increase the inclusiveness and uh, diversity and equity uh, amongst the uh, advisors and advice that we're able to get in our work. When the pandemic started, um, we repurposed some of the funding that we uh, gave to uh, jurisdictions and healthcare systems. We were able to fund some uh, equipment in some places that assisted with virtual care, being able to provide iPads and, and things for people. We supported some lodging for uh, Indigenous patients who had had to travel uh, quite far, for example, for radiation treatment, and then were sort of stuck when the lockdowns came about. Um, we created several initiatives. One was that we brought together the, uh, all of the surgical societies to help with some of the guidance around prioritizing, both prioritizing cancer surgery among other types of treatments, but then even within cancer surgery, how to uh, prioritize there. And we've also uh, worked with the screening programs and developed uh, advice on how to reopen, how to safely reopen uh, screening programs during uh, a pandemic. And this, we've had a lot of feedback that this has been very helpful in several jurisdictions. We also help support partners in the sense that a lot of the people that we work with on, on various initiatives were just the type of people that needed to be uh, redeployed for contact tracing and various things like that. And so we continued our financial support for them as they were uh, redeployed. And then there were several things that we were already working on that turned out to be very helpful for the pandemic. So for example, as part of our work in colorectal cancer screening, we were trying to increase the efficiency of endoscopy for positive uh, colon screens with the, the FIT test. Um, and we've received feedback that, that that sort of work has actually helped endoscopy programs to be maintained during the pandemic when other things were being shut down because we had helped with the efficiency and triage of those systems. Uh, they were able to help not just screening patients, but patients presenting with, with symptoms and other indications. Other work that uh, has helped with this, we've been working across the country on the idea of paramedics providing palliative care to patients. So typically, if you go back a few years and still in several locations, paramedics have to stabilize patients and then transport them to the hospital. But we've been working on several initiatives where paramedics can be trained to deliver palliative care in the home. And this has resulted in 50% fewer uh, emergency room and hospital uh, visits and actually takes less time for the paramedics because they don't have to wait around outside an emergency room. And so we've seen several uh, provinces actually expand this work after the pandemic struck because it freed up paramedics to do other things that they were needed for. Other areas of interest that have been helpful, we're working with uh, provinces now to try to uh, switch cervical screening from the pap smear to HPV screening, which is a better test. It doesn't have to be done as frequently, but even more importantly, can actually be done through self-sampling. 
So if we are talking about resiliency and uh, how the system can deal with potential future pandemics, screening programs would be able to continue. Similarly, for the colon cancer screening, we've been helping provinces do this through direct mail where patients would not have to actually go and interact with a family doctor or healthcare system. Again, uh, a simple initiative, it seems, that could really allow screening to continue despite a pandemic. And then lastly, work that we're just beginning on models of care is one way that we may be able to help with this problem of increasing capacity when we have issues of limited health, number of healthcare providers and burnout, et cetera. So we're working with several provinces uh, to get initiatives going around diagnos diagnosis and speeding up diagnosis through navigation, dedicated pathways, uh, or uh, dedicated clinics for that, as well as things like hub, hub and spoke models, where care could actually be given in smaller centers closer to home um, and not all have to necessarily be brought into a specialized center, um, and increasing scope of practice. For example, there are uh, types of systemic therapies that can be given with nurses that aren't necessarily as highly trained can be given in smaller centers um, using OR technicians in place of OR nurses for, for different things, trying to use the capacity we have, the resources we have to uh, increase capacity and help reach that sort of 10% surge. And then there's the other important work of the uh, new strategy. So I've already talked a little bit about this, but there's a worldwide global call to eliminate cervical cancer and we can do it through increasing HPV vaccination, uh, through better screening, switching to HPV screening, as well as uh, improving management. We're also working with every single province in the country to get organized lung cancer screening programs uh, up and running. And I mentioned the uh, importance of equity in our new strategy. We're working with uh, 29 uh, partners in every single jurisdiction to uh, develop strategies and priorities for uh, Indigenous groups. That work is going on over the next couple of years. And then the challenge will be to make sure that we're actually able to, to implement those and, and address them. And then lastly, models of care, which I was just talking about around diagnosis and treatment, but we also have very important streams around survivorship and palliative care, in particular, how to better integrate the cancer system with primary care systems. And with that, I'll end, uh, see how much time we have and happy to take any questions if we do have time. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Um, that, that was very, a lot of information and we've got some great uh, questions. So thank you so much for your uh, willingness to take a couple before we move on to breakout groups, uh, Dr. Earl. So um, I'm going to turn it over to our question section and, and, and read one out here for you. Um, so, so one question that comes up a lot and not just in oncology, but we'll ask it from the oncology perspective. Um, how do we encourage ongoing and better funding for prevention and screening in cancer and generally? Seems like money always goes to treatment and care uh, once the horses are out of the barn. Wouldn't we do much better with um, precious resources if we kept things from happening instead of waiting until they do? I'm sure you have a lot to say about this, but if you can give us some info briefly. Uh, it, it's incredibly important uh, question, and it sort of comes to what we saw early on in the pandemic. You know, our healthcare systems are unfortunately set up to deal with crises, uh, to deal with rescuing people from diseases that they've developed, uh, etc. When, with foresight, we could actually do so much better with uh, with prevention. You know, things like improving the built environment, encouraging uh, exercise healthy eating, those sorts of things, probably more important than uh, many of the other things that we do. Um, and so I think it's continuing, you know, we've showed you some modeling here. There's a lot of modeling around uh, prevention, how, you know, 40% of cancers are potentially uh, preventable and continuing to hammer away at the uh, economic uh, case for this. I think showing the 
the uh, economic rationale is going to be increasingly more important uh, as the uh, reckoning from all the spending with this uh, pandemic comes uh, comes to roost. Uh, I wish I had a simple answer because it would already have been uh, been done, but uh, it's to keep going with uh, with that important work, making those arguments in the business case, really. Thank you. And again, I'm sure we can take that into other health areas um, as well. So uh, do you have a minute for another question, Dr. Earl? I certainly do. Okay, super. Um, is CPAC seeing any suggestions that COVID-19, including the use of virtual care as people are paying to access services faster, has changed cancer care from a relatively comprehensive care system to one where there is more fragmentation? If so, what can be done about that? Is there a role for family physicians to play in improving comprehensive care of cancer patients? So several questions. <laughs> yeah, uh, excellent question. On the point, so first of all, for virtual care, uh, there was a paper uh, published out of Manitoba recently that looked at uh, total number of visits with oncologists. And while in-person uh, ones went down uh, dramatically, uh, virtual increased. And so overall, the uh, contacts, at least in Manitoba, with the cancer care system uh, did continue. Um, so, you know, that's, I think, reassuring. And as Dr. Sedev was saying, I certainly find in my own practice that there are certain things that are, are completely appropriate. In fact, I, I love it now when I have a follow-up visit and I'm catching the patient at work and they're really just taking 10 minutes to have a conversation with me and then they're, they're uh, back at work. Uh, in terms of fragmentation, um, I can't say I have data uh, on that in particular, but you know, a reframing with the, the latter part of the question around uh, primary care is that uh, you know, one person's uh, fragmentation could be another person's integrated, shared uh, uh, care amongst a, a broader team. And so the, the key is to um, make sure that the handoffs, that the communication, that uh, all of this is well-coordinated and then as opposed to fragmentation, the same thing could actually be a better uh, source of care. We know in survivorship uh, in particular, but also likely palliative care, that primary care physicians are often the best people to, to do this because they know all the other picture of what's going on in a patient's life. There are other medical uh, issues. And uh, so if we can figure out how to do coordinated care better, um, then uh, it won't be fragmented. Great, thank you so very much. Um, there's definitely a lot to take from this conversation and it will feed into the, the sessions that we're having um, after this today's session and over the course of the rest of the summit. So thank you so very much. Um, I think we don't, we, we need to wrap up our questions though, um, to keep to our agenda. So I just want to thank you again for, for joining us and presenting and, and offering some insights into solutions that uh, people asked about. So thank you so much again, Dr. Earl, for your time and your my, expertise. My pleasure. Thank you. Um, so I will, um, again, take a moment to thank all of our speakers today uh, and turn it over to our moderator for the summit, Leah, to get us going uh, into our working group session. Thanks, Leah. Thanks, Antonella. Fantastic content today. Wow.